Gray, hello. Um, Ekjelasi, welcome back to Treaty Rights 101. We left off on this slide with an activity of examining our worldviews. Um, and now we'll pick up on slide, um, here I'll fix my face, <laughs> slide 32, continuing with um, reconciling the truth about treaties. So the next section we have here is the government's intention. When we look at the government's intention and perspective, we see the government or the crown views treaties as an agreement to trade a First Nation territory for um, quote unquote bounty and benevolence. This type of language makes First Nations wards of the state and under the government's protection. With these, with these agreements, not only could settlers expand west and northward, but also indigenous peoples were forced to assimilate into a new economy. No longer would individual nations be dependent on one's traditional lifestyle, but rather begin to assimilate and integrate into a Western capitalistic settler society through farming, developments, and other land exploiting and people exploiting means. To the government, the treaties were essentially a beneficial commercial exchange of both land, body, culture, and identity. Um, what else can I share? So originally, Indigenous peoples felt the treaties had the potential to satisfy the needs of their communities and foster mutually respectful relationships and understandings between themselves, the Crown, and all settlers. But through the signing of treaties, Indigenous peoples believed that their sacred agreements were everlasting and had many reasons for believing so. And lastly, we have the violation of treaties. So Canada is seen as a oppressive colonizer whose main purpose and main goal was to gain capital through the exploitation of indigenous lands and indigenous bodies and black bodies, because that is what is at the basis of our entire economy and our entire state most prominently because the government is more concerned with exploiting indigenous peoples and their lands rather than negotiating and collaborating with us and respecting our inherent rights to protect and to speak for the land and the water. Upon signing these treaties, um, yeah, upon signing the treaties, Canada's, um, Canada obtained control of most aspects of society, especially in schooling, resource extraction from exploiting the land and water, land use and implementation of laws for various social issues, and implemented, and implemented the Indian Act, which controlled who had and didn't have status, controlled ceremony, gatherings, access off and onto reserve lands, farming, purchasing and selling of goods, human rights, women's rights, children's rights, gatherings, ceremony, and traditional practices, and implemented the Indian residential schools across Canada and an overall cultural genocide of Indigenous peoples and Indigenous land. So before we go forward, into breaking down treaty education and relationships, I would like to play a small game with you called Myth or Fact to unpack some of the most common myths, um, stereotypes or thoughts that are happening, right? Since I'm not here with you today, um, please raise your hand or shout out when I say myth or fact, um, assuming that you're in groups of other folks learning this today. <clears throat> Just gonna grab some water. So treaties are land sale agreements. 
myth or fact? The answer is myth. So historically, treaties were not purchased agreements <clears throat> where indigenous nations were offered compensation in exchange for the surrender of their lands. Instead, they were nation to nation agreements that established the terms of how sovereign entities would coexist peacefully while sharing and protecting the land. But because treaties were written from the British perspective, often before negotiations had even begun, the paper terms of the agreement differ from other historical accounts. For a balanced view of what each treaty really means, you have to understand the indigenous perspective. Whether it was through wampum belts, ceremonies, oral histories, and or written, rec written records of what was said during treaty negotiations, all provide valuable corrections to any misinterpretations. Treaties are best understood by looking at all of the ways in which a treaty was recorded not just through the written document, right? So it's about thinking about all the methods that have been used to communicate and document events, not just adhering to one truth that written documents are the only way. So prior to European arrival, indigenous nations had already entered into treaties with other indigenous nations. For example, the Dish With One Spoon Treaty or just with one spoon wampum belt, right? That I mentioned earlier at the beginning of part one. Indigenous nations have a long tradition of making treaties that outlined responsibilities to the land and established agreements based on peace and friendship. When Europeans arrived, treaty making was already a long standing feature of indigenous relations. Okay. Treaties only benefit Indigenous peoples. Myth or fact? So the answer is myth. A common view among settlers is that treaties only benefit Indigenous people. Many non-Indigenous people view Indigenous rights as being secured through treaties and also see this as an unfair privilege that is withheld from non-Indigenous people. However, the truth here is, it is because of treaty making that settlers are able to enjoy the benefits of living on this continent, on this land. With O treaties, settlers would be illegally occupying this land. Think about that. Okay, prior to European arrival, Indigenous peoples didn't enter into treaties. Myth or fact? So I actually just realized I kind of gave this answer away a few slides ago. Um, so the answer is myth. Indigenous peoples have a long tradition of making treaties that outline responsibilities to the land and established agreements based on peace and friendship, respect um, to share and protect the land, right? And when Europeans arrived, treaty making was already a long standing feature of indigenous diplomacy. Okay. While much of what is now known as Canada is covered in historical and number treaties, not all Indigenous nations have signed treaties. Myth or fact? What do you think? So the answer is fact. While much of the central corridor of what is now known as Canada is covered in historic and number treaties, one to 11, not all indigenous nations have signed treaties. For instance, of the 198 nations or first nations in British Columbia, more than half do not have signed treaties with the government. Okay. 
So many early treaties were described by First Nation communities as peace and friendship treaties. Myth or fact? So the answer is fact. Many of the early treaties are described by First Nations as peace and friendship treaties. The intention was to always share and protect the land, food, water, animals, everything, and to go forward with peace and friendship. And last one, treaties have no relevance today. Myth or fact? I mean, if you're attending this, if you've already watched part one, you probably have a good idea. If you're here listening, why are you even here listening? Um, so the answer is, of course, myth. Many settlers believe that treaties are a thing of the past, right? They think that all treaties were negotiated before Canada became a country and that they are no longer a part of the way of life that um, the Canadian government engages with Indigenous peoples. Not only are treaties still being made today in the form of comprehensive land claims, treaties made in the past remain legally binding agreements between nations that must be adhered to by all settlers residing on this land. The phrase, we are all treaty people, is an effective way of expressing the legal obligations and responsibilities that all settlers have to uphold and must uphold the terms of these treaties. And in order to ensure that these contracts and agreements are upheld, settlers must educate themselves about the obligations and responsibilities that you have to the land, the water, and to Indigenous peoples. Okay, so hopefully by now, you have learned many, many new things. Um, so the history of treaties is in one localized province or city or territory can be complex and cannot be fully learned in an afternoon, let alone an hour workshop. And at this workshop, um, as this workshop will be viewed all across this land, everyone watching is coming from a different place from different histories, stories, and treaties. Today, I will be um, giving you your first step in understanding treaty education and treaty relations and your obligations and responsibilities as a treaty person. But it's your second step is for you to go forward with this new knowledge and understanding to further deepen um, your awareness and practice um, in life going forward. So first, I'd like to situate ourselves by zipping, like super quick, zipping through the last, you know, 500 to 1000 years. However, with any history lesson, I first share that Indigenous peoples have been living on this land, protecting and caring for this land since time immemorial. So around 1000, we have Viking explorers arrive into Hamkuk, so the land across the water which is now known as Newfoundland. 1450, approximately, we have the Haudenosaunee Confederacy unites five nations. So we have Mohawk, Onondaga, on on Oneida, Cayuga, and Seneca with the intentions of creating peaceful decision-making. We have 1492, Christopher Columbus, the Spanish arrive. 1497, John Cabot arrived on the coast of Atlantic in Mi'kmaq. So Mi'kmaq territory, um, including places known today as Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. 1534, we have Jacques Cartier sailing across the Atlantic Ocean um, from Europe and entered the Gulf of St. Lawrence. We have 1610, um, Grand Chief Member II was one of the first indigenous people of North America to enter a treaty with the Roman Catholic Church and Pope Paul V. Um, we have around the 1700s, Indigenous peoples um, 
start to enter into treaties with the British Crown. So the British colonies of North America and the British Crown and the Canadian government, right, entered into treaties with Indigenous nations to have peace and friendship and to share and protect the land. Around 1763, right, we had the Royal Proclamation um, stating that all land in North America is considered to be Indigenous land until ceded by treaty. 1838 is the first Indian residential school opening in Brantford, Ontario. This is the first one recognized. However, as Indigenous peoples, we know this type of schooling was happening much prior to this date, especially along the East Coast. In 1860s, we have the first Indian Day School um, in the 1860s in, cl in close to 700 Indian Day schools operated across what is now known as Canada, which is five times more than the number of Indian residential schools. 1876, the Indian Act was enacted. 1930s, the first Indian hospital. Once again, this is a date that is recognized by the state, but we know that people were stealing and experimenting on Indigenous peoples and Indigenous children much, much prior to the state. Much, much prior. Eight, uh, 1951. Where am I? Yes. Um, we see First Nation women and subsequently their children lose Indian status due to the Indian Act. 1950 to 1980s, we have the 60s scoop, which takes um, taking place due to the hands of social workers, social services, policing, government officials, Christian churches, Christian organizations and institutions. 1970s, we have starlight tours happening, um, predominantly in Saskatchewan and other northern communities. If you are not familiar with starlight tours, it is when police officers without arrest um, sorry, it is when police officers would arrest Indigenous people, often without cause, and they would drive them to the outskirts of the city at night in the winter, take all their clothing and abandon them, leaving them stranded to die in the cold. 1997, we had the last Indian residential school closing in Saskatchewan. From 2000s to about present, it's still ongoing, we have the Millennial Scoop, and most people are aware of the horrors of residential schools, but most people don't realize this genocidal system continues today, just in a different way, specifically through child welfare systems and the foster care systems. Today, there are more children in the foster care system compared to the number of children adopted out during the 60 scoops and the children who attend at residential schools. The 2000s, um, the last Indian Day school closed, which was held in Quebec. We have 2008, we have the classic no good Stephen Harper um, apology, offering a formal backhand apology on behalf of Canada over residential schools. From 2008 to 2015, we have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission forming and dissolving, organized by the parties of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. In 2015, the TRC issues its final report documenting the experiences of over um, approximately 150,000 residential school survivors. In 2012, we have four women start the Idle No Movement, Idle No More Movement, as a national and online movement of marches and teachings, raising awareness of indigenous rights and advocacy for self-determination. 2016 to 2019, we have the inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people. It's launched um, in response to calls for action from families, communities and organizations. The final report released in June, 2019 outlines 231 calls for justice. In 2016, um, Canada officially signs, quotation marks, um, the 2007 UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, 
which recognizes indigenous people's rights to self-determination, cultural practices, land, and security, among a million other things. However, it has been five years and they still have not implemented it into law. And as of December, 2020, they have tabled this once again. And for reference, today is February 28th, 2021. So it is not implemented with law in law and is not upheld through um, law. So what is a treaty? What are treaty rights? And what are indigenous rights? So when I talk about treaties, I am talking about negotiated long-term mutually binding agreements, which are made between nation to nation and also made between indigenous peoples and settler society and settler government, right? The Canadian government. Treaties define the rights, responsibilities and relationships between indigenous peoples and the federal and provincial governments. Treaties are constitutionally protected government to government agreements that identify, define and implement a range of rights and responsibilities and obliga obligations. Um, just give me one moment. Oops. So treaties are not simply just a piece of paper. They are a solemn act. It is about protecting the land, sharing the land and working together in peace and friendship. And we all have responsibilities and obligations as treaty people. So what are treaty rights? Treaty rights are rights set out in either a historic or modern treaty agreement. These rights along with indigenous rights are recognized and affirmed by section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982. Treaty rights and indigenous rights are also a key part of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, that thing that the Canadian government signed but haven't implemented the law that I mentioned earlier. Um, treaties define specific rights, benefits and obliga obligations for the, sign for the signatories that vary from treaty to treaty. Treaties and treaty rights also vary depending on the time and the circumstances in which they were negotiated. No two treaties are identical. The treaty rights of an individual treaty will depend on the precise terms and conditions of that treaty. Treaties form a legal relationship between Indigenous peoples and Canadian government and all people living on this land. And what are Indigenous rights? So Indigenous rights are the collective rights of distinct Indigenous nations flowing from their status as the original peoples of this land. These rights are recognized and affirmed by Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982. In summary, Indigenous rights recognize treaty rights. They recognize First Nations, Inuit, and Métis as the original caretakers of this land, title to land, and speakers of this land. They also recognize cultural and, so and social rights, equality among genders, and commitment to participate in constitutional conferences. So as stated pretty much word for word uh, with little modification, within section 35, it states, the existing Aboriginal and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada are hereby recognized and affirmed. Definition. In this act, Aboriginal peoples of Canada includes First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Land claim agreements for greater certainty in subsection one, treaty rights include right includes right that now exists by way of land claims agreements and may be so acquired. Aboriginal and treaty rights are garnered as equal to all genders. Commitment to participation in constitutional conferences, Prime Minister of Canada to invite representatives of Indigenous peoples to attend. Okay, so the historic um, and modern treaties go all across this land from, or all across the land that is now known as Canada. 
And given that we are coming from all different parts of the land, I'm going to touch a little on different treaties that I have mentioned here. Remember though, this is just an overview. The history and treaties go much deeper and further than what I'm covering today. This only touches the surface, scrapes the surface. And as a treaty person, it is also your responsibility to self-educate. I also strongly encourage you to spend time after today looking into the treaties that occupy the stolen land that you live and work upon. To support truth and reconciliation, we want to learn how deep these treaties go and how rooted they are in the relationships or lack of relationship with the Canadian government. We now know about what it means to reconcile the truth about treaties and the treaty relationship and the impacts of this narrowing view and different perspectives, the government's intentions and the continued violation of treaties. As you move forward, use this lens to better understand the treaty relationship when learning more about treaties on the territory you live and work upon. So the government of Canada only recognizes 70 historic treaties in Canada signed between 1701 and 1923. These treaties include treaties of peace and neutrality of 1701 to 1760. As the British and French struggled for control on North America, they transformed their relationship with First Nations with the intention of receiving military alliance for both sides. After the Seven Year War, two treaties were signed to make a time of neutrality in exchange for sharing the land, right to trade and right for protection. The Peace and Friendship Treaties of 1725 to 1779, where British authorities in Nova Scotia signed a series of treaties with the Mi'kmaq and Maltese peoples of the Maritimes and negotiated for peace and friendship. Upper Canada Land Surrenders and the Williams Treaties of 1764 to 1862 and 1923. In the Great Lake regions, 30 treaties were agreed to where land was taken by the Indian Department of Aboriginal Peoples until 1862 in exchange for a one-time payment. <sighs> In later years, many descendants of treaty signers said land was taken unjustly and further negotiations have happened and are happening. There's someone paying above me, but I'm not sure folks in here. This included Southern and Eastern Ontario, Georgian Bay, Ottawa River, Lake Simcoe and Bay of Quinte. Robinson Treaties and Douglas Treaties of 1850 and 1844, or sorry, 1854, which were responsible for the creation of reserves, annuities, and the continued right to hunt and fish on unceded lands. It is stated that the Douglas Treaty surrendered land in exchange for a continued right to hunt and fish, reserve lands, and a one-time payment. However, as I've said several times, and as I mentioned earlier, Land was never sold and land cannot be sold. Land cannot be owned. This included the Great Lake region, Lake Huron and Georgian Bay in Vancouver Island. The number of treaties of 1871 and 1921 refers to a time when the government of Canada undertook 11 treaties with the intention of securing indigenous title in the Northwest 11 treaties were negotiated to encompass all of the prairies, Northern Ontario, and the Peace River and Mackenzie River Valleys. Modern treaties from, eight, from 1975 to present. Just before the first modern treaty in 1973, the Supreme Court of Canada first recognized Indigenous rights. Since the signing of the first modern treaty in 1975, Canada has signed 25 additional modern treaties or comprehensive land claim agreements with several Indigenous nations. <clears throat> so here is a visual of a colonial map where the government of Canada 
only recognizes 70 historic treaties in Canada signed between 1901 and 1923. I will leave it here for a minute for folks to look. Um, it is color coded as well. And then another map as well, um, number of treaties or post-confederation treaties are a series of 11 treaties signed between indigenous peoples and settler Canadian government. So it's a little hard to see, um, but I'll share some of the stuff I see. <laughs> so we have Treaty 1 of 1871, the Red River and Southern Lake Winnipeg, Manitoba. Treaty 2 of 1871 of Southern Manitoba. We have Treaty 3 of Southern Man Ontario and Manitoba from 1873. Treaty 4 of 1874 from Southern Saskatchewan. Treaty 5 of 1875 to 1889 in Northern Manitoba. Treaty 6 of 1876 to 1889 for Central Saskatchewan and Alberta. Treaty 7 of 1877, Southern Alberta. Treaty 8 of 18, 1899 to 1901, Northern Alberta, Saskatchewan and British Columbia. Treaty 9 of 1905, Northern Ontario. Treaty 10 of 1906, Northern Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And Treaty 11 of 1921, Northwest Territories. Finally, we've made it to treaty relationships and treaty responsibilities. Okay, so treaty um, education, right? Why is treaty education important? Treaty education creates opportunities for non-Indigenous people to learn about Indigenous nations, their inherent rights as, or inherent Indigenous rights and in treaty rights, and the shared history we all have. The significance of treaties are not only in the words contained in the document or documents, but in the conversations and ceremonies that accompanied the, negotiate, the negotiations establishing meaningful, peaceful, and respectful relationships. Reciprocity is also important here as it speaks to the mutual beneficial relationships between people, as well as between people and the land. So thinking about reciprocity with the land, I mean, what does that mean? What we have today here is a vehicle for us to begin the long-term generational journey towards reconciliation, as reconciliation is not an Indigenous issue. It's a Canadian issue. It's a settler issue, right? It's a Canadian government issue. And it is focused on self-education, truly and really listening and validating the truths about what happened on this land and what is still happening on this land, as well as repairing the relationship that is broken. Treaties are important because their foundation is peace and friendship, focused on how to live together peacefully and to share and protect the land for our generations and yours, right? It's about all of us and our future descendants. They were never about ownership of land, right? Land was involved indirectly and land was never traded or ceded or given up. Indigenous peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial. Early relationships between Indigenous nations and colonial government were made through treaties and were based on mutual respect and cooperation. The intentions of treaties were to provide a framework of living together and sharing the land that was originally inhabited and cared for by Indigenous peoples. However, as time went on, these relationships were eroded due to the Crown, Canadian government, settlers, 
Christians and missionaries, right? Through inflicting violence and harm, through exploitation, through cultural genocide, through forced assimilation and colonial policies and colonial laws. Most of these agreements describe exchanges where indigenous nations agree to share some of their interests in their ancestral lands in return for various payments and promises. Over time, the balance of power shifted and the crown or government, right? Their intentions, the crown and government's intentions were not in peace and friendship. Through policy and laws, we see a history of cultural genocide and a huge, huge shift in attitudes towards indigenous peoples. Violation of treaties, historical events and policies, Indian residential schools, the 60s scoop, the millennial scoop, every and all carceral system, like the prisons and criminal justice and child welfare, exploitation of land and exploitation of indigenous bodies and so much more that broke the treaty relationship. So where do we go from here? To be a treaty person simply means to understand who you are, how you fit in the process, to understand what you have to do to ensure that the treaty process works. Start with self-educating. With the plethora of books, videos, and resources that live online, in bookstores, YouTube, Facebook workshops, never stop reading, listening, and growing. And do not rely on your Indigenous friends or Indigenous colleagues to educate yourself. Read the full reports of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the inquiry and final, well, the final report from the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two spirit. They are big documents, but it is important that you read the full reports. Learn about the history and the ongoing challenges happening upon the stolen land that you live and work on. And show up when Indigenous peoples ask you to show up. There is power in people. It is in me and it is in you. And when we come together, we can create power and change. Show up and support. Indigenous people need to continuously fight for their rights today all across this land. There is power in people and power in all of us and you can channel your energy and power in showing up and taking action today to fight against the government's capitalistic colonial agenda that continues to exploit Indigenous land and Indigenous bodies for the benefit of the government, developers, corporations, pipelines, gas companies, water companies. Capitalism and colonialism wants to exploit everything and everyone to put more money into the pockets of those who have the most power and control over this land. And we know this is predominantly white, cis, male, hetero, able-bodied people decolonize your spaces and undo the capitalistic and colonial ways that you uphold every day to the ways that you know, be, and do things. When you don't work to decolonize your spaces, your work, your personal life, everything around you, you continue to cause more harm and violence for Indigenous peoples. Honor and listen to the truths of Indigenous peoples who share their experiences, knowledges, and stories. Celebrate Indigenous ways of knowing, being, and doing, and recognize Indigenous knowledge as true, valid, and extremely valuable, more valuable than Western knowledge. And work to build respectful relations rooted in reciprocity, respect, peace, and friendship. So questions I leave for you, 
split off into groups and discuss the following questions and make sure you share with the larger group your ideas, thoughts, and plan of action. So some questions to take forward. How can you reconcile our shared history to ensure justice and equity? What does a respectful and meaningful treaty relationship look like for you in your everyday life, work, and practice? What does it mean for you to honor the treaty relationship? And lastly, but definitely very important, what does it mean to practice reciprocity with people, with land, and with water as all separate but also collective things? Well, Alio, thank you all for hanging out with me and for engaging and listening. I hope you were able to learn um, something new from today about your responsibilities um, and the things that you must uphold as we are all treaty people. And before I go, I have one last question. Who here is a treaty person? Please stand up, raise your hand, make it known somehow. Well, Alio, thank you again. Misitnogoma, all my relations.